So you already heard a lot from me, so I'm, I'm not going to say too much more other than uh, echo what Vinny said. Space is really important. It's been the, uh, the underpinning of, frankly, everything else we're doing in the operational imperatives. We cannot complete the operational imperatives without space, and we'll be talking a lot more about that. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Is this working? Okay, great. Hey. Hey, so I'm Arthur Grahl from SpaceWorks, so I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on, on SpaceWorks. Uh, so how does SpaceWorks fit into all this? Well, so how do we compete in a uh, great power competition with China? How do we win that? China's really good at a top-down approach where they focus on resources and kind of have a whole government against very specific capabilities that they're building, and they've been quite effective at that. I think uh, from our side of the fence, American ingenuity and innovation is how we win in that competition. And the way we do that is from the bottoms up, from academia and from industry and companies bringing the best and prize ideas to bear on that fight. So at SpaceWorks, we provide non-dilutive capital investments into these companies, academia, and ideas. And that can vary all the way from phase one studies up to strat buys that could be uh, upwards of $60 million invested into that or more. And uh, just, you know, we could do a lot with strat buys. So even with the strat buy, we could get all the way up to a prototype. And one of, actually one of our strat buy nominations was uh, hop, being able to get a space vehicle into GEO and then that space vehicle would grab another space vehicle and throw it into the graveyard orbit. So those are the kinds of great things that we can do with strat buys. And then, so how do we all do that in SpaceWorks? So SpaceWorks is a big, you know, is a team, and we have uh, the Spark team, the Ventures team, and the Prime team. So on the Spark team, uh, they focus on connecting with the warfighters and the ecosystem, educating folks, and they also focus on our challenge workshops and on our challenge program. So our first challenge program is Tackle Responsive Space. Uh, we had uh, over 302 companies submit responses for that, and we chose 19, and invested $34 million into that. So that's how we get collaboration with, with uh, industry and the whole government and the nation as a whole. Uh, on the space venture side, uh, they run our server sitter portfolio. So we have uh, Open Topic, which is, you know, bring us our, your unfiltered great ideas. Specific Topic, which is, Hey, let's gather specific challenges. And then of course, tack by strap by for our really big investments. And that's all enabled through AppWorks, through scaled operations, with uh, partnering with App Ventures, contracting, finance, due diligence, and all the great things to be able to actually award hundreds of contracts to be able to get after that. And then lastly, our prime team is focused on priming the market. Uh, so this is going after very specific missions. Uh, our first one is Orbital Prime, and that's getting after uh, in space, servicing, assembly, and manufacturing, or dynamic space operations. And uh, they're really going out there being a first mover, seeing how they can transition that space, accelerate it, and stimulate that market so that we, we can bring that to bear for the warfighters. Thanks. Test, test, how's the microphone working? All right, good deal. Um, as we mentioned, my name is Jared Evans from the Office of Strategic Capital. Uh, for those who aren't as familiar with, uh, with the office, we're relatively new. Uh, we were announced initially by the Secretary back in uh, early December of 2022. Uh, so we've been around uh, as an organization for just over a year now. Um, spent uh, a lot of our, our year last year getting things stood up as an office, all the normal kind of operational stuff, you know, office space, getting the initial folks hired, all that kind of fun thing. Um, and um, uh, in addition, working legislative proposals, culminating in, in the latest NDAA, where OSC was established uh, in law, um, and we were also, uh, as part of that, granted some new to DOE authorities for loans and loan guarantees, right? We'll come back to that in just a moment, right? The uh, OSC was stood up to attract and scale private sector capital towards our national security priorities. Uh, uh, when we look across all of our critical technology areas, and if you're not familiar with, with uh, uh, Undersecretary Shoes, 14 critical technology areas, um, it's, it's worth uh, worth a look to kind of see our, our priorities there. Um, uh, but when we look across these areas like semiconductors and you know quantum applications of all different kinds and, and AI as nebulous and as, as, as large as that space is, right? And, and you you know 
uh, look at the money that's going into these technologies across our economy, right? Most of that doesn't come from the federal government. Most of that doesn't come from the DOD, right? So it's imperative on us to work alongside our, uh, our really healthy uh, capital markets that we have in the U.S. Uh, with the investment community that we have in the U.S. Uh, in order to uh, maintain our, our, our you know, technological advantage uh, across all of these really important things. And um, oh, we do that a few different ways, right? This is where we come back to the, the loans and loan guarantees, right? So um, uh, we've got four different primary uh, lines of effort when it comes to attracting and scaling that private sector capital, right? Our predominant is these loans and loan guarantees, right? This is something that we had to work through. Um, uh, for those who aren't familiar, uh, or it's kind of, um, uh, these sound kind of weird in the DOD sense, there's actually 131 federal credit programs throughout the government, right? So this is not new to a lot of other folks. Um, uh, this is a, a new to DOD authority um, that we're, we're, we're able to leverage a lot of the, the really impressive knowledge uh, that's across the federal space implementing it for the department. Um, but what this represents is a, a, a really categorical different, different business model uh, in how we work with uh, not only what traditionally thinks of themselves as the defense industrial base, but our true no kidding supply base across the economy, which is really important. Um, uh, so lowest loan guarantees, if, if you're not familiar with loan guarantee, the VA home loan program, great example, right? You don't go and get your home loan from the VA, you go to a bank, right? And the guarantee that the VA provides, which is only 20% by the way, it's not 100% like, like I always thought, um, uh, that's enough to shift the risk calculus for them to provide you preferable terms, right? And so that's really what we're getting after with a lot of these programs is, is a risk calculus, financially speaking, that allows uh, companies, well, allows capability providers to um, have access to capital to work on our most important problems, right? These critical technologies. And so um, there are other uh, really important pieces of OSC as well, in addition to these loans and loan guarantees. Uh, for instance, we're working through, uh, with a partnership with the SBA, uh, through the SBIC program, uh, not SBIR, but SBIC, Small Business Investment Company, whereby the federal government provides funding to investors to then turn around and put that into, uh, into those critical technology areas, right, into companies providing those capabilities. Um, uh, this, this program has been around since 1958. Uh, it's been, it's not, not new by any stretch of the imagination, right, but this is the first time where we have this critical technologies initiative, this, this, this portion of those SBA funds that are uh, really focused on our critical technologies and being able to leverage those through this partnership. Uh, we also have my program, the Transition Acceleration Program, where we help syndicate funds uh, for DOD users to you know, be able to maximize the capital going towards their priorities. Uh, and they also have an international side that, that is being developed as well. Where we're able to take advantage of good ideas that come from other places, right, into our types of operations. So uh, the four different ways we go through that, all, all, all have different audiences, whether it be the government as customers, whether it be individual companies, whether it be investors, right? So there's tools for everyone to take advantage of those. Um, and, um, you know, we'll talk through some of the other details, you know, through, through the Q&A the here. But um, uh, one thing I'll note here just on the front edge is that uh, we have released uh, just this morning our investment strategy. So um, you can look up that on our website. We've got, you know, the socials that are, are circulating that through as well. Uh, but you can kind of see how we take those critical technology areas, how we think about them, uh, both in the aggregate and also individually. And how can we say, you know, how, where do we go first, right? How do we, how do we excel in, in certain areas uh, such that we can be collectively successful? All right, thanks, gentlemen. So this, this is actually kind of a, an interesting opportunity for me because uh, I don't know how many of you have ever had the opportunity to moderate a panel that your boss is on. Uh, so, and, and then Dr. Gray said, you know, you're not off the hook. I think the last time we briefed, uh, I had a chance to brief you, uh, you killed one of the projects I was uh, looking to uh, do in pursuit of the library. So knives out, right? Um, just kidding. All right, so uh, just for uh, the audience here, I think the way we're gonna structure this is uh, we're gonna have, I'm, I'm gonna tee off a few questions here. Um, but then we are around the halfway point going to pivot to allowing the audience uh, questions. So please start thinking of any topics that you may want to bring, ask the, the panelists here. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll pivot back to some of the questions if, uh, if there's time remaining. All 
Right. So with that, um, one of the first questions uh, we wanted to ask you, gentlemen, was at a broad level, in your perspective, in your organizational perspective, why is space important? And what are the biggest challenges and opportunities that you see are being pursued by the DAO? Dr. Grayson, we'll start with you. All right, great. Yeah, thanks. So, um, like I said, space permeates operational imperatives. Uh, so it, it's been interesting as it's evolved. There was its own operational imperative looking at space, but now it's really more aligned along mission threats. So there are things that are uniquely space missions. Uh, one of the very first ones out of the gate, which is a legacy before there was a Space Force uh, core mission to space, missile warning, missile track. Uh, yeah, the, the AF space at the time has been doing that for decades. That's a core mission. Um, there's a theme connected to that, that what they're really doing is provide, they're a service provider for the joint force. They're not doing missile warning, missile track for their own sake. They are providing that to all the tactical warfighters saying, hey, someone took a shot at you and there's inbound coming in your direction, duck and cover. Uh, or, you know, MDA is obviously a big, a big customer to be able to provide targeting into, you know, missile defense capabilities. So that's an example where they are a service provider to the Joint Force. One of the really interesting things is the next big one out of the gate uh, from an OI-1 perspective is looking at communications. And in the, we're calling it very creatively space data network. Uh, I wish we'd come up with a Gucci or term. But the, 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 the idea, and I, I don't like this term either because it's too hand wavy. But really the mindset is create a space internet. You know, so for, for those of you who don't deal a lot with space, SATCOM tends to be its own thing. Uh, separate from communications, it's satellite communications. And it usually is very bespoke. You're buying terminals to talk to a particular satellite with a particular protocol. That's not how the internet works, okay? So, so could we create a full architecture that allows terrestrial users to arbitrarily connect to space. And, and we know some big companies that are trying to do this for the consumer. From a military perspective, we need much more resiliency and diversity than one solution, but that's on the right path. So that's another example of a service provider to the Joint Force. You mentioned OI3, providing sensing to weapons so we can have sensor to shooter and beyond line of sight kill chains that look over the horizon critical capability from space to the joint force. And then there's another area which we normally can't talk much about, but there is a fight in space. Uh, that's becoming a, a, space itself is becoming a, a, an increasingly congested and contested environment. And we gotta worry about that. And, and so if, if all of those, space force and their combatant command that they support, space command, the thing that they uniquely are responsible for is that fight in space and then operating things in space. But at the end of the day, they are a key provider to the joint force. And, and that's why they're so important. Great, uh, so I'll, I'll go next. So why is space important? Well, in my humble opinion, uh, space, without space, we would be deaf, blind, and mute as a nation. So it's really our eyes and ears and our ability to be able to speak. Also, I don't know how everyone else got here today, but I, I used Google Maps to get here. I uh, didn't have to use MapQuest like back in the day. Uh, but you know, we, where, where are you as well? I mean, these are all import, important services that space provides that we kind of take for granted day in, day out. So uh, what are some of the challenges we're kind of going after? I, I would say for OI1, uh, Space works. we're really going after the really high risk uh, mission areas uh, to fill the gaps in areas that maybe OI-1 hasn't fully captured yet. I'd say a couple of those would be tactical response of space. Uh, so if an adversary launches something into space and we need to quickly respond, maybe within 24 hours, launch our own uh, satellite vehicle and do an inspection of it, uh, how do we do that? Uh, or maybe we can have something already on orbit where we go see them and say hi. Uh, that could be, that's something that we've been focused on. Uh, also, dynamic space operations. You know, if we're in geo and we need to be able to maneuver without regret and be able to uh, maybe inspect other, uh, our, our friends up there or maybe our adversaries, 
uh, we need to be able to do that. And we need to uh, have the field to be able to train operators and be able to go after those targets. Uh, so I would say those are some of the challenges where we're trying to fill the gap in those high risk areas and seeing how we can fit that more into the objectives of OI1. That's great. I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's, you know, at least in, in the circles that, uh, that we're in, right, we have a really deep appreciation of, of space as a, a joint warfight domain, a joint economic domain nowadays as well, right, in, 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 to a growing degree. Um, and so there's a challenges associated with that, not the least of which, how do we work together, right? That's a big enough question just when the government was up there, right? Uh, but now, with when you have so many more players, well, how do we work together? We have different incentive structures, we have different reasons for being up in the first place. You know, how do we how do we do this in a way that's that's useful? Um, but alongside that, right, every challenge is an opportunity, right? There's a there's an opportunity again from the OSC lens to be able to leverage all the new interest that's coming into into the in this area of operations, if you will, right? Because you know, regardless of um, you know who's putting material right uh, up in space, who's sending satellites, who's who's doing sensing in all different various types and forms, um, it's all high value, right? They're up there for a reason because they're they're getting you know competitive value. They're they're getting um, a lot of usefulness and, and and benefit overall. And so you know as their you know commercial opportunities uh, begin to kind of proliferate a bit. Right, they're also going to have a need to protect their assets. Right, it's just as difficult for them to get up there as it is for us. Right, and so um, the uh, they're going to want to protect things. They're going to want to be able to see things and, and and do all the things that we care about now. Right, but we have the benefit of, of having been there a little bit longer. Right, and so there's opportunity for us to to work together. Right, that's a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. Uh, and it's all a matter of you know how do we do that in terms that are understandable by both sides. Again, different incentive structures different reasons for being there. There's a lot of things that are different, but at the same thing, at the same time, there's also a lot of, re a lot of things that are similar, right? And that provide, that, that common foundation allows us to be able to have some of these conversations, right? And to work forward on how we can, you know, uh, make capital accessible to the folks who need it. How do we, you know, work with our commercial, you know, launch providers, right? To, to, to get where we need to go collectively, right? Um, and uh, so it's it's a it's a dynamic time for sure, uh, but there's a lot of opportunity space that we're excited about uh, when it comes to working with others and, and aligning the incentives. So that's a that's a perfect segue to the next one. Now that we've talked at a broad level about OI one and your organization's perspectives towards it, let, let's follow you back the other way. Uh, starting with you, Mr. Evans. Where do you see industry aligning with your organization's agenda in pursuit of OI one? Sure. So we are uh, inherently and deliberately uh, positioned between, um, you know, kind of the, the s and or rdt &E space for those on the government side, um, and the program, right, and the economic space, if you will, right? And so, you know, as an example, our Strategic Capital Advisory Council is co-chaired by r and &E and a and S, right? I think that's, that's emblematic of that tie uh, between the two worlds, right? And, um, you know, so we're stood up, we're tasked with working with other people, Right. In contrast to the, to the other gentleman on the stage here, we don't own any mission areas. Right. We're not putting up satellites or, or, or you know, doing any of these, you know, working with any of the capability providers in the same way that they are. Right. Really focused on access to capital for our, our toughest problems. Right. And space technologies is one of those critical technology areas I was talking about. Right. Um, which has the benefit of being very broad uh, for, for your applications. But the, the uh, ultimately, Right, uh, this provides an opportunity for us to work together, and uh, we are naturally, naturally tied into how do we pull these incentive structures together? How do we, how do we align uh, interests such that we can work together uh, in a very legitimate, very natural way? Right, there's a lot of persuasive arguments that happen in government contracting. Right, persuading something that you know you need, you know, to 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 work towards a procurement contract or trying to get through a technical evaluation. Right, using financial tools. Uh, provide, you know, allows us to, one, uh, compare opportunities much more directly uh, and to utilize some of these you know, natural, very legitimate incentives uh, in a way that makes sense across uh, the DOD space and the commercial space. Well, so I, I think for SpaceWorks, it's all about demand signal. So uh, one thing I've been working with the team on is like, how can we better partner uh, with the PEOs, with the combatant commands, to be able to understand 
what their priorities are and how we can take that and kind of give that as a demand signal to industry so they can go, they can apply their, you know, all their great innovative ideas towards that demand signal that we're uh, reaching out to industry for. I think another way, you know, just, just like, uh, you know, Jared's talking about, I think it's all about partnering. So if, if we're able to partner more with OSC, with DIU, with other organizations to kind of, you know, say this is what the demand signal is, and this is what the government's going after, I think that'll help all the commercial market come together to try to go after those specific problems because they, they know that there's gonna be investment into that and that that's something that the government is interested in and we could you know we could be part of that solution between the dual use technologies between commercial and defense. So I, I look at this when I look at it from an industry perspective, I almost see two separate industries. And it and it's not the division between commercial and traditional. It's the commercial between big full system and constellation providers and small uh, space subsystems component kind of providers. So, you know, I think that both are really important for this. And I'm seeing a lot of interest and excitement from both communities. Um, word of advice to the audience. For the small end of things, the component end of things, uh, guys like both of them are a great starting point to get those things going. There are very few government program offices that will go then buy at large scale those subsystems as standalone things or go as a specified directed thou shalt use this subsystem to a big system developer. So the encouragement is after you're wildly successful here, reach out to the primes. And they could be traditional or commercial primes. That's your transition path if you're a subsystem provider. For the, the big guys, again, whether it's commercial or uh, traditional, um, I'm seeing a huge opportunity for a radically new business model. The, it, and I, I'm a huge fan of services-based delivery of capabilities. So, so rather than selling a satellite or selling a con constellation to the government, Technically, the company would maintain ownership of that as their infrastructure, and what they're doing is delivering space sensing, space communications, space p and as a service. Uh, I think that's huge. Uh, I think it's a huge opportunity for the government. I think it's a huge opportunity for industry, and I'm starting to get some very positive response from industry with interest in that area. Uh, where it is so exciting from a space perspective is, we can thank Dr. Kepler for this, uh, the predictability of orbital mechanics is such that if I as a customer come to you and say, I want a certain amount of communications coverage and capacity and accessibility in this part of the world, you can go through and do your orbital mechanics calculations and predict incredibly definitively exactly what you need to go build. I mean, from a market perspective, that is beautiful to have that kind of forecastability and predictability to figure out then your capex investments to go build out this infrastructure. So I see that as a huge opportunity. I'm getting a lot of resonance from people I talk to, both in industry, but also on the investment side. And this is where things like loan guarantees or you know, a lot of the investors for this model are, are not the early stage VCs. It's, it's major corporate banks that are going to do, you know, infrastructure loans, you know, or, or very large types of VCs to fund the full capex of a whole constellation, not early stage development of the capabilities. That's why I think of it as two very, very different um, industry ecosystems for the same problem. All right, sir. Um, all right. Following up, uh, we'll do, I'll do one more here, and then we'll turn it over to some audience questions. So the OIs were published in 2022. Spaceworks launched in late 2021. OSC started more recently in December of 2022. Uh, and Dr. Grayson, you were appointed to your position in 2022 as well. Um, do you feel that your organizations have made measurable progress uh, towards meeting the OI 1 in 10? Is the pace of advancement accelerating, or are we on a more linear growth path uh, towards the finish line, however it may be? So, so there's definitely acceleration. 
uh, at a very exciting acceleration. Um, I'll start with the frustration, and I alluded to this already in my talk. Uh, you laid out this timeline very nicely. Um, as I said in my talk, uh, from a Washington bureaucratic perspective, we have been mind-blowingly successful. On paper, we've moved $40 billion. Not a penny of it has actually shown up in any program office's coffers yet. That, that's, that's where my only frustration is about speed, is we, we've got to get going faster on, on releasing and, and appropriating those funds. That all being said, uh, you know, despite that fact, I'm incredibly excited. I am seeing, first of all, things being able to get going even without that appropriation through existing funds, existing programs of record that don't need the new legislation to get started. And people are moving out. People are moving out and getting started. And very importantly, it isn't just, to your point about incremental, a lot of the things we're looking at doing are total um, inflection points in how we're doing things. Even the traditional missions, and I, I can't go too far into the how, but even for traditional missions like missile warning, missile track, uh, the work that's being done is totally changing. All the old programs of record, moving away from those, moving into a completely new architecture. And then some of the areas are totally new missions, like the, the space-based skill chains. Other? Yeah, so I'll go next. Uh, so I'd say that as an organization, we're shifting more and more towards how can we affect the OIs as much as we, as we can at our level. Uh, so, you know, I already talked about attack responsive space, advantage space operations. We also are working on alt uh, We're also working on spaceport of the future. And then we're also looking to see if we could uh, have another, uh, another big impact with uh, maybe with uh, communications. Uh, so those are, that, those are the areas where we've been prioritizing and working with the PEOs and the COCOMs to see what are the top priorities. Uh, I would say though that it, it is accelerating and we need to figure out how to accelerate further. So we, we've been, you know, we have a lot of great tools within SpaceWorks, you know, going all the way up to uh, Stratfies where we could actually do on orbit prototypes and some real mission capability. Uh, but uh, I, I'd like to partner more with all the other organizations to see, hey, maybe we could, how can we scale this more? Uh, I, I want to see this all scalable. I want to be ready. If there is a conflict, I want us to be able to tap into these resources from all these innovative uh, ideas and companies and just be able to say like, okay, we're going to run a contract. It's already ready to go. And then, you know, provide these as a service. And uh, let's get to the fight. So I, I think that's how we'll, we'll win if we get into a conflict. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I um, uh, mentioned the OSC, you know, big announced December 22. Um, you know, having you know, stood up the office last year, uh, being able to bring these new authorities to the department, um, and uh, you know, working towards appropriations um, because we're at FY24 New Start um, uh, in the department. You know, I think we've made made a lot of made a lot of progress. I mean, uh, I don't know for those of you who maybe signed up on our, our mailing list, you, you've seen all of the different positions that we're hiring for. Um, I mean, we're hiring like bankers, investment bankers. We're hiring folks who have lending experience. Like, there's no, there's no military MOS for underwriter, right? For loan underwriter, right? It's kind of wild to think about. Um, uh, and so we're bringing a lot of these new talents to the department, right? Standing up these capabilities, uh, having been given these authorities. Um, but there's a lot of growth left to do, right? Uh, whether it's actually hiring the folks that you know going through the door, whether it's actually standing up the loan program. Uh, whether it's you know next FY, which is coming in another you know six seven months, right? We've got another doubling of the organization um, uh, coming along with that. So um, there's a lot of growth to be had, a lot of a lot of uh, improvement and and uh, you know depth to to gain. Um, but we're very excited about the prospect of, of how we've gotten, uh, how far we've gotten thus far, and um, you know with the support of the other secretaries and the and the secretary um, as, as well. You know we're uh, looking forward to the future. Think, just to make sure I heard this correctly. So, Arthur, you were talking about how um, some of the acceleration on the space work portfolio is already starting to happen. Yeah. And the other, the, the other two of you said that some of that inflection point, that catalyzing moment, is still to come. No? Uh, the, the statement. So, um, it, the inflection point's already happened. Okay. It, and it's happening in the thinking and the architectures 
and the direction the programs are taking. Uh, that's happening already. Uh, I, I, things never move fast enough for me. Uh, I'm still very frustrated it's not moving fast enough. I, I wish we were actually building things two years ago, right when we came up with the ideas, um, as opposed to still waiting for the money to show up. That, that's, you know, they, I've talked to people in industry that, that frankly, if we had said go when the first discussions happened, could probably be starting to put things on orbit by now. Um, so in that regard, we're not moving nearly fast enough. And, and again, it doesn't start truly becoming real, all these new programs, until we get the appropriation. But, like I said, people are out of existing programs, out of existing funds, moving out anyway. And they're moving in a, in a direction that already represents this inflection point. Okay, thanks, Dr. Clark. Do you have anything to add there? Oh, yeah, I, I think that's emblematic of, of you know, what we're doing, even, even not having started in, the, you know, in, in budget terms. Um, being able to work with the support of, again, the Undersecretary uh, out of her front office budget, right, to, um, to stand up the SBIC program that was announced back in September uh, as uh, starting with this, this critical technology initiative. And we've got funds coming in the door being, being underwritten now. Um, and, you know, the first relatively small tranche of those, you know, are bringing $2 billion to, to critical technology areas across, across the space, right, just as an, an early indication. Um, and so, you know, working with uh, you know, government customers like Space Force, working with the Army and the Navy and some of the other, uh, other strategic capabilities that they need to bring to bear uh, and understanding what those priorities are um, and, uh, and moving out on some of those opportunities on behalf of the Undersecretary, um, you know, are all, are all great opportunities where we've, we've kind of worked forward, you know, not waiting on, on others to do, but, you know, being able to be assertive there and, and uh, demonstrate the powers of these tool sets. Um, and, and these approaches, so it's very exciting. If I can, if I can do an add-on uh, to, to some of that, the, the thing we did get this year already is the authorization bill. And, and again, we, you know, some of us like to grouse a little bit about Congress with the appropriation, but like I said in my talk, our, our four committees that look over national security issues are, are incredible. They're very supportive and they're really doing good things. And so I really want to thank them for what they've done. One of the things they did in the NDAA was authorize, uh, get, give the departments a new ability to start spending money on things before there's a fully approved, appropriated new program record. And before the money shows up in that two year value of death. And I, I, it's pre-decisional, so I can't say specifics, but uh, Secretary Kendall is already moving out with that new authority. And one of the new quick start uh, projects we're going to do is space related. I'll just leave that as a cliffhanger. I'll add one more thing to that. So this week, when we were with Indopaycom, there were like two things I heard multiple times. It was, we have to be able to blind the enemy, see the enemy, kill the enemy. And then another one was accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. So I think that just speaks volumes to Indopaycom and their mission and what they're worried about. I think we definitely have to go faster and we have to remove roadblocks, which you know I think everyone on this panel is working every day. So. Okay, thank you for that clarification for those uh, those additions there. Um, all right, I'm going to open it up to any questions from the audience. You had your hand up in the beginning for the first question. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I love the, the, the two things you brought up that I really like about what you Please step behind you. Okay. So, the two things I really love that you talked about was the collaboration and then the flow of money. I got curious about the whole Valley Down thing a couple of years ago. So my partner, uh, Art Kevin, and I, we kind of started navigating and built a database, stripped out every transaction from the federal government, from aircraft carriers to blue ballpoint pens. And so when I look at my, what we call the defense addressable market, the dam report, in the space domain, we have FFRDCs, and you have UART, and then you've got the OT consortium. With just one with ATI, the OT consortium, they're getting $13 billion a year, three year money, that if you come and make requests to that, that the, the domain, domain, they can automatically contract and directly run them. That's a big chunk of money. So your space, you know, your um, uh, uh, space dynamics, dynamics lab, the York at Utah State, they have like fixed massive amounts of money, multi year money, 
saying there that if little startup X wants to get, says they can do something in space, they can help them figure out how to survive that launch and that orbit in that place, and they're ready to go. And then you've got Aerospace Corporation, which says $100 million sitting there trying to help them transition. So in that sense, how are we able to bring these pieces together and identifying who has all these little, you know, little quote unquote $100 million pockets and bringing them together to harness them to achieve what you're trying to accomplish doing that kind of unified work as opposed to just playing that on the other side. I can start off. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, before this, uh, I used to work with big programs of record over on the space war fighting side. I, uh, we, we had uh, a pretty big budget, uh, you know, ACAT 1 programs, and uh, we didn't have the flex, even though we had a lot of funding, we didn't have quite the flexibility of the requirements phase. And even with uh, what Congress allows us to do, to be able to go after uh, some of these innovative ideas and bring them into the fold. Uh, so, you know, we are, you know, I've taken those lessons learned, I brought them into this job, and I am working hard to see how we can collaborate and how we can break through all that. And, you know, I, I would just say it takes time, and that's something that we're all working on collectively here of how do we partner, how do we bring money together so that. Uh, you know, even though Cipher and Sitter is awesome, we have a lot of great uh, tools that we can use uh, from phase one to strat buys. Uh, I, you know, I think having other tools where we can kind of scale up from the strat buys and have uh, those production lines ready or, uh, you know, be able to help scale, uh, I think that that's where I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see what those opportunities are. We're looking to see how we can do that one. Yeah, I mean, on, on the OSC side, um, again, we're, we're really focused on these financial tool sets, right? Um, and this allows us to focus much higher up in the value chain than what we traditionally as a DOD uh, have worked within, right? And our business models largely through contracts, through integrators, right? Uh, to be able to, to pull together, you know, the incentives such that, you know, all the subs and all the sub components and everything comes together in a, in a package that is useful, right? Uh, with these financial tool sets, we can work directly with those suppliers, right? Ensure some of those, uh, you know, ensure some of those uh, those components, those capabilities up upstream are there for our capabilities focused approach, right? The contracts and such to be able to pull from, right? There's, you know, our our acquisition system relies on multiple sources being available, right? DoD in a lot of ways is is an elastic demand curve. Right, and so you have one source of supply. There's not a whole lot we can do in certain situations to get what we need to get right and do it efficiently. And so one of the ways that we're going about that, again, these loans, loan guarantees, right, it's categorically different, and it allows folks again to translate between um, uh, different opportunities from the financial perspective, right? Because debt is a, is a much different tool than contracts, right, or than that that type of NRE, for instance, right. And so there's different different capital needs at different times of companies, right, in different situations, and we want to make sure that there's there's access to all of these different types at the appropriate time, such that, again, we can get where we need to go together. Okay, thank you. All right, this side. Hi, thanks. Uh, so I'm uh, a veteran, 26 years in the Army, have 22 years in space operations and a small business owner now here in Austin. And I, I've actually you know, put in proposals to the, the uh, Cibber and Cibber programs. One of the capabilities that I'm really concerned with as a former warfighter is uh, the debris population in space and the, and the direction that that's headed and the risk that it presents to both our national capabilities uh, to fight through it and also really the budget limitations of doing space domain awareness. You know, we're tracking over 80% of the catalog is debris. We're spending approximately $800 million on that, on, on that tracking. So it's a it's a, a waste of our operational resources to be tracking trash. Um, I've heard kind of whispers and, and being around the, the, the community that the DOD doesn't see debris as a threat and that it looks at ADR is more of a science project that's over to NASA to fix. And I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at Ms. Uh, Dr. Grayson really in particular to address what the DOD's stance on active debris remediation is. So I, Thank you. Yeah, so it's a great question and I think it's a great observation. 
Um, I, first of all, I have to caveat by this isn't something we're looking at in the operational areas. Because you know, we're, like I said in my talk, very focused on what do things look like during a major war with China um, or a pure competitor. Uh, the, so, so I'll call it the day-to-day -day peacetime competition phase types of issues that can be very real aren't high on the list. So I'm, I'm speaking from my personal experience in the past, having spent about a decade doing space domain awareness related things. So I, I totally agree with the issue. I don't think, I, I don't know where you're getting the murmurings. I would, I, from what I hear, I don't see a, uh, a discounting of that problem or, or, or ignoring it. Uh, there, there, one big thing that could be leading to some of, of what you're hearing is that there is a very much a big push that for space domain awareness to move the core maintenance of the catalog, which would include even things like day-to-day -day debris tracking, to Department of Commerce as a commercial mission. Or I think it's the Commerce. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, um, it, and the reason for that is very much tied to the kinds of things we're looking at in the operational imperatives. How do we free up capability and capacity of U.S. Space Command and U.S. Space Force to worry about very active uh, things, bad things happening in space as part of the war, as opposed to the day-to-day the -day standing thing. So that, that may lead to some of that perception that DOD is discounting it. it and the, I think the problem, that, I mean, we're in one of those interesting times right now like, like many of these things that we're talking about on the panel, where you're in a transition phase, where the new mission is not fully stood up, it's not fully resourced and defined, while because of new priorities coming in on the DOD side, there's, there's a potential stand down. So it's that, that transition that, that may be some of what you're feeling. I, 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 can't, I, I don't have any more insight in that. Uh, a little bit more inside. I, I would say yes to all of the above. Uh, I, just because active degree removal isn't necessarily something Space Force is chasing doesn't mean it's not important. We're just partnering with NASA. NASA's going to be the lead for active degree removal. So uh, if you want to advance in that, I, I would work with NASA. Um, I mean, the creation of minefields counting on the accountability work is what I'm talking about. And it, just, and it just feels like we're wishing away the fact that there's going to be large catastrophes in space in the event that there is a war that will actually prevent us from delivering all the capabilities that space does in the world. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. We are going to get the hook in a little bit here, so I want to make sure that the panelists have a chance to make some closing remarks uh, before we, we end this panel. So, Mr. Evans, we'll start with you. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, being excited for the future and, um, you know, as uh, the space domain in particular becomes more accessible, um, you know, there's there's an opportunity that we, we referenced a, little, uh, a bit previous here uh, that I think is really important to take advantage of, right? Um, both in terms of leveraging the knowledge that we've gained over the last, you know, few decades, right? Uh, in terms of working together, in terms of, um, you know, looking at our upstream supply chains Right, because a lot of these satellites, a lot of these capabilities, as an example, they take really exquisite minerals, they take really exquisite suppliers, they take really exquisite equipment of all different various kinds, you know, being being ran hard, right? That's, that's not necessarily something that comes inherent with, with terrestrial things in, in a lot of cases, right? So there's a lot of upstream work to be done and partnerships to be had such that we can we can maintain that, that advantage and having that supply in all of its various ways. Um, that's available for not only the national security mission, the national defense mission, but also our commercial and economic surety as well. Um, and so we're really excited to be trying to be part of that solution. And um, you know, if you have any more uh, questions about OSC, obviously more ha more than happy to to walk through that uh, with folks. We also have a great website that run runs through a lot of kind of the basics as well. Um, and then again, just a footstop, our, our investment strategy was published this morning. Um, so that's always a um, exciting time. So you can read through exactly you know how we think about some of these problem sets, how we rack and stack things, how we think we can work together more in much more detail. Um, and you know this is something that will be 
be updated uh, annually, and we'll come out with additional programs and, and all of this will tie together uh, as we move forward. But just wanted to, wanted to provide that information. Thanks. I'll just give one more add-on. Uh, so we're not, the U.S. isn't the only ones looking at our great ingenuity and innovation and our supply chains. Uh, China and Russia are as well. Uh, so an important thing that we do is this due diligence process where we work with companies to make sure that we don't have this foreign influence. And I think making investments into these companies either through the funds that we provide here at Space Wars, so even OSC with their lending programs, ensures that those companies and those ideas stay within our economy and is used for our fight. Uh, so that's just one thing I wanted to emphasize. Uh, and then if you want to learn more about SpaceWorks, uh, there's plenty of us here these few days here. Uh, you can also go to our website, uh, spaceworks.us. We have a lot of Ask Me Anything and uh, lots of resources you can learn more about. I'll just reiterate a couple of things I said. Biggest word of advice, if you're a small company, leverage all of these things. The question about UARCs and FFRDC, leverage those to get started, get catalyzed, mar and then market the price. Uh, if you're a big company uh, and who can who can who can actually build and operate full constellations, I'd love to talk to you about space as a service. Uh, and the last thing I'll leave you with is something that my boss, Secretary Kendall, likes to state all the time with questions about speed, pace, are we making an advance? Uh, like I said, I think we are. We're not moving fast enough. He likes to quote uh, General MacArthur, who said most, almost every failure in warfare can be summarized by two words, too late. So we're, we're doing our damnedest not to be too late. <laughs> okay, thank you.